Monday marks 15 years since the Oklahoma City bombing, the nation's worst homegrown terror attack, taking the lives of 168 people. Up until now, Timothy McVeigh has never been heard publicly admitting that he set that bomb. His taped confession before his execution, part of an MSNBC two-hour special documentary, The McVeigh Tapes, Confessions of an American Terrorist, hosted by Rachel Maddow, who joins me here now. Rachel, it is chilling, to say the least. Extraordinary. I mean, we've seen, there was one interview with him on 60 Minutes, but he never admitted his role before. Um, what, in, in listening to all of this, and we'll play a little bit of, of it, uh, how, does, how do you come to grips with just the, the mental quality here, the, the sinister quality of this evil. It's incredibly sinister and one of the things that I was worried about in getting involved in this project is I don't want Timothy McVeigh to get a soapbox. I don't want him to be persuading people of his crazy views, but upon hearing these tapes, he's not going to persuade anybody. He really comes across as repellent uh, he's, he comes across as a sociopath. I mean, I'm no expert. I have only a layman's understanding of that term, but he really comes across that way. Completely callous to the humanity that he stole with this, with this act. But he's very calm and cool and collected in the way that he planned and strategized this event. In fact, this is a bit of the audio of this interview that he did. And uh, in the documentary, there is a simulation of what he would look like. But this is basically his voice. Yes, exactly his voice. Right. That's right. Got this adrenaline pumping, but you force yourself to stay calm and, and not be noticed. I then pulled up the light, which was right at the time. I did the two minute fuse at the stop light. And I swear to God, it was the longest stop light I ever set in my life. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, it's lit. Green, green. I'm thinking, People are going to miss the suspicious. So, well accelerating, I had to roll the window down. I was adjusting to turn on the fan and blow it up on the window, the frosters, right? And I'm trying to clear the smoke out by the time I pull up, because it's going to look funny. I was rolling the windows back up as I pull in. I didn't want to do it after I stopped, because we're talking about seconds now, right? Absolutely cold. There's no affect. There's no emotion about what he's about to do. No, he's, and he's completely impressed with himself. He thinks of this as having been a great success. He looks back at what happened in Oklahoma City. There's absolutely no remorse. It's the opposite of it. He looks back and he thinks that was a successful military operation. He was waging war against the United States government on behalf of what he thought of as the, the patriot movement, the anti-government militants that he allied himself with. And, of course, April 19th, also the anniversary of Waco, which is one thing that helped inspire him. Yes. Uh, Bill Clinton today in Washington speaking about Oklahoma City and warning about some of the, of the mood that preceded Oklahoma City and warning against some of the political rhetoric now. This is what the president, the former president, had to say today. Before the bombing occurred, there was a sort of fever in America. The fabric of American life had been unraveling. There was a lot of violence in our uh, cities. There was a rise of gang violence in particular. What we learned from Oklahoma City is not that we should gag each other or that we should reduce our passion for the positions we hold, but that the words we use really do matter because there are, there's this vast echo chamber and they go across space and they fall on the serious and the delirious alike. And he, in a reference in a New York Times article yesterday, an interview that he did yesterday, preceding this event today, he talked about some of the rhetoric, frankly, from the protests and the Tea Party protests and Michelle Bachman and her particular use of the word gangster to reflect our government. This was Michelle Bachman yesterday. Mm. I think they don't realize that your IQ scores are way above average. We're on to them. We're on to this gangster government. Hey, you look happy to me. You don't look angry. That's because you get it. And you are smart enough to get off your couch and do something about it. So this November, what do you say? Let's take back our country. It's one thing to rally about winning an election, but take back our country from a gangster government? 
That's the issue that former President Clinton at least raised. Yes, President Clinton responding that, saying they are not gangsters. They were elected. They are not doing anything they were not elected to do. I, I, I think, is there a lesson we can draw here? Well, there is. You know, it's, it's hard because every time you say the rhetoric matters, people say, are you accusing me of being violent just because of my political speech? You're trying to stomp on my, my first free speech rights. I think President Clinton is getting this right. He's, what he's saying is it's not that you shouldn't be passionate. It's not that you shouldn't be even bombastic or hyperbolic or over the top, but don't encourage violence. Even if you would not commit that violence yourself, there are people who are listening to you who may be slightly unhinged or sociopathic the way that... Timothy McVeigh is who will hear that as a green light to go and do the things that they are they're com they feel compelled to do because of their own anti-government views. You interviewed Janet Napolitano the other night on the Rachel Maddow show, and you were asking her whether they're at Homeland Security whether they're seeing signs of more right-wing militia movements. You know, is there a, an uptick in this as we get? not only because we've come through economic hard times and are still in the recession, according to many people's experiences, but because people are angry, so angry at government. Do we are, it's, it's sort of hard to quantify. I mean, the, what right. the government says is, yes, there have been arrests, and they're not going to talk about ongoing investigations where there haven't already been arrests. And so, uh, obviously, the Hutari militia group that was arrested, uh, in, one ways they, in one way, they seem sort of comical and cultish. Uh, frankly, actually, some of their more, the most cultish-sounding and strange-sounding things about them, their theology, is shared by other people in the militant anti-government and militia movement. Um, obviously, we had somebody fly a plane into an IRS office for anti-government reasons. We have had a number of incidents, groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center that, for their own reasons, monitor militia groups, say that, qu that they, they have quantitatively assessed that the number of groups is growing. I wanted to ask you about a decision, a memorandum that the president issued today, which does extend new legal rights in cases of, in, in, during the issue of medical emergencies oh, right, yes. to gay partners yes. and it's become a big issue because there's a strong feeling in the gay and lesbian community that because the president has not acted more you know, rapidly on don't ask, don't tell, lifting that, changing that, pushing Congress to change that, that he has really not lived up to his campaign promise. This is one big campaign promise and he even called uh, one woman uh, who lost her partner of 20 years and could not be at her bedside even though she had power of attorney that the hospital in Florida would not let her be there and would not let her bring their children. I, I, How big a deal is this? I will say just personally as a person who's been openly gay for most of my life I would say that this is one of the things that does sort of keep me up at night the, the worry that in a personal emergency that I wouldn't be allowed to be by my partner's bedside or that she wouldn't be allowed to be by mine and so it is just personally in my personal life I can tell you that it's an important thing this is a regulation that essentially says you cannot discriminate in that regard in hospitals. In, the political ter in political terms, President Obama promised he'd be a fierce advocate for gay rights. And the, 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 the slow pace, uh, the very deliberate slow pace on don't ask, don't tell is absolutely a matter of frustration um, among gay rights supporters uh, that, who are also supporters of President Obama. But he has done a lot of decisive things. There's this act on hospital visitation. There's the hate crimes bill that he signed, which was a huge decades-long struggle. The extension of some benefits to federal employees and their same-sex partners. Um, the travel ban on people with HIV. And again, HIV, not just a gay issue, but something very important uh, to the gay community. And that is, those are all concrete things that don't get the headlines that Don't Ask, Don't Tell would, but they have been positive changes. But still, we see more passion from, of all people, Admiral Mullen than we see from the White House on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I think they're being very deliberate as a political strategy. I think that when the president says that he's going to do this, he means that he's going to get it done, but I think they're just treading incredibly carefully, mostly as, because they think they need to do that in order to get it passed. We'll see whether that strategy is borne out in the end. Rachel Maddow, it's always a pleasure. We look forward to the documentary Monday night, two hours on MSNBC, and of course to your program tonight and every night at 9 on MSNBC. Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you.